going on uh, over there somewhere? Well, looks like uh, a peace deal has been signed. The NATO uh, summit has just ended. I uh, just watched a little bit of what Rasputin had to say. It looks like uh, they're going to get everybody to commit to 2% of their gross domestic product uh, over the next 10 years to uh, contribute to a rapid reaction force. Uh, meanwhile, there is rapid reaction forces in the Ukraine uh, doing drills. Uh, Canada is a part of it as well, uh, and so on and so on. Now, again, this is something I've always said about drills being very close to the zone of conflict, and they always train for. They're shows of force. They're not necessarily actual drills because, you know, when you have uh, a conflict, you you, you know, uh, doing a drill right beside it is you know kind of provocateuring right um most people see that so that said uh the peace plan apparently was signed between poroshenko and uh uh putin um i'm thinking that uh putin's 12 point peace plan uh i haven't looked at all the details of it uh, but they're looking at it and um there's still shelling going on in in, in the ukraine um I think it's kind of a, a bit of a crossroad. You have to understand, the central bankers, they want to get us into a war any means necessary. Uh, a lot of people probably still have a hard time with that concept, but yes, these people, like, they, they're, they're complete psychopaths. They're, they're, you know, because if we don't get into a war, and war being a racket and making money, if we don't get into a war, uh, the economies, there's going to be nobody to blame the economy failure on, and that's not looking good right now for, the, for economies around the world. Uh, which I'll probably touch in another video because it, there's just too much to talk about on just that front. There's a lot going on right now, like tons going on. Uh, very scary. Uh, that said, um, you have military advisors inside the Ukraine for God knows how long now, uh, a couple of months anyway. Uh, so it's kind of funny how, <coughs> okay, um, there seems to be a bit of a debate whether Ukraine is a part of NATO or not. Well, it, technically, it's not. So you're probably saying, well, what's the Ukraine doing there? Or what's NATO doing in there? Well, Ukraine is NATO's interest to become relevant again, you know, because NATO hasn't been relevant for a long time. And I don't, and NATO's a waste of money. It, it really is. The money people spend to stay into NATO, okay, uh, that money could be put into their own military defenses. And they probably spend more on NATO than they do on their own military defenses. And they could have state-of-the-art stuff, state-of-the-art training, you know, and that, that would be good enough. Uh, Canada, we're not too bad off military-wise. Uh, a lot of people don't realize how much we've invested, reinvested into our military. It kind of goes like this. 1950s and 60s, we had about 80,000 soldiers uh, because of the Cold War Part 1. We're in Cold War Part 2 now. And we ended up getting a, a fairly big military. And right after World War II, we were like the, one of the largest militaries in the world. We were very, 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 very large. Uh, but Canada decided that we weren't going to be uh, a global military. We were, you know, uh, we did peacekeeping. And uh, I used to object to the peacekeeping role, and I still kind of do because of how it's implemented. Uh, and it got a lot of guys killed. But it was better than a direct combat role. Problem is, is in the day we live in, this day and age is, you know, there, there's no places where you can put peacekeepers. You know, if you need peacekeepers, you need you need a combat role. So it's kind of like they're shooting at each other, right? And you're caught, you know, monkey in the middle, uh, you know, trying to play referee. So you know, peacekeeping has its its challenges and its downsides, but it's a lot. It's non-aggressive. You know what I mean? Like it's you know it's it it is better because you know you de-escalate the situation. And Canada was known as a peacekeeping country forever and ever and ever. Then 9-11 happened, uh, you know, at a time when uh, Kretzier was out there saying, oh, we don't need tanks. Tanks are, you know, they don't use those on the battlefield anymore. We don't need them. And, you know, we our, our military had been gutted pretty much from the Trudeau years to the Kretzier years. Uh, even through the Maroonie years, I mean, there, there was, uh, Rooney didn't really spend that much on the military. Our military kind of flatlined it. Now we're about 25,000, 30,000 guys, and then maybe 300,000 personnel all in. Uh, that's number of bounces around, so it's it hard to say. But you have to understand the training our guys get now is second to none, and uh, a lot of the equipment we use is very, very state of the art. 
Uh, a lot of it's still hand-me-down American equipment, but uh, even with that, uh, there's a lot of Canadian innovations where we take, you know, slightly worn equipment and turn it into, you know, you know, stuff that suits Canada's needs much better. Uh, but that, that's kind of where we're at. And right now, uh, we're kind of de-escalating our military a little bit because, you know, the role in Afghanistan is kind of uh, wound down. But it looks like we're back into Iraq as well. Uh, we've got 100 military advisors there. Military advisors is basically boots on the ground. You know, they won't call it boots on the ground, but that's what it is, you know. So we're getting involved with this ISIS thing. We're getting involved with the Ukraine. Uh, Canada does not have the, the money to do that, you know. Uh, so if we're putting money into that, we're taking money from our country's defense. Uh, that's guaranteed. That, that's what NATO does. It's, it's, it's a leech. Um, some people might like NATO. I'm not a fan of NATO. I never was. Um, you know, I don't think NATO is really needed for the most part because, uh, yeah, coalition forces, you don't need NATO to make coalition forces, you know. Uh, and the idea, well, yeah, but you have to have that guarantee people are going to come to your rescue. There's no guarantees in anything like that. You know, there's no guarantees. Because what happens, let's say two allied countries actually attack each other uh, and they're both NATO members. Then what do you do? You know, you know what I mean? So to me, sovereignty is more important than the global, uh, you know, Agenda 21 type military. And that, that's NATO. That NATO is basically the banker's military. Um, and when you're looking at it like that, it, it kind of says, you know, if you take more, say, like a Switzerland type of approach where your military protects your country, look, Switzerland is a neutral country. They, you know, they stay peaceful. They, but mind you, Switzerland is a neutral country for probably not the reasons a lot of people think. Uh, it may, basically, that's where all the really corrupt bankers go to do their business, so they don't want that country to ever get attacked or get, it, you know, get involved, right? So, uh, but with that said, they still, as a country, they don't get involved. And, you know, the Ukraine, for example, they're s sitting there saying how Russia shouldn't be involved in the Ukraine. Uh, it doesn't have the right. But then, again, Ukraine not being a NATO country... Um, you know, like, why is the U.S., the EU, the IMF in there? And they got in there through a coup. No matter how you look at it, they got in there through a coup, not through election. And people in the Ukraine are really starting to wake up to, uh, there's some Ukrainians that they didn't know who George Soros was, but they're going to remember who he was. They're going to remember who he was for sure uh, and how he helped destabilize the country. They're going to understand what the Rothschild banking system is really about, and they, they are, I mean, you know. Um, the reason why, I mean, just look at it this way. You have government forces from one side of the country killing civilians on the other side of the country in the name of anti-terrorism, okay? But if they were just to actually do more of a, say, a peacekeeping kind of mindset and take all the Ukrainian soldiers, move them back outside the cities uh, and stuff like that and just, you know, create a line, sure, uh, but don't try to take ground because you're just killing too many civilians in the process. And on the uh, eastern side of the country, um, uh, or the western side of the country, well, both east and west side of the country, people are basically saying, hey, look, we want to change, we wanted a less corrupt government, and we got a war. Our pensions are cut off, winter's coming, there's going to be no gas, uh, and there's a war tax, uh, there's a draft, people are burning their draft conscript, uh, you know, uh, things. Uh, people are getting arrested for, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, like they, you know, they went from bad to worse very quickly. Uh, there's no way you could argue the Ukrainians are better off before the Maidan coup. You know, the, the Maidan coup, they were in a bad situation. They were already in a bad situation. Now they're in a really worse situation, if you know what I mean. Um, and you have people, you know, on the other side, you know, they're, they're not all pro-Russian there. Uh, one of the things, like, uh, Russia annexed Crimea because they knew they could uh, get away with it, Right. You know, there was enough people there demanding it. Now, the the rest, like the Lugansk and Maripol and all that area, it's kind of a 50-50 or less. You know, like some people are pro-Russian, some people are, are just regular Ukrainian. And you have video out there of, of like little old ladies sitting, saying, why are you killing Ukrainians? You know, it's like, you're our own government. You're sent here to protect us and you're killing our own people. You know, so it's, and then you got other areas of the country where people are getting together, they're both Russian and Ukrainians saying, hey, we don't want this. And most people don't. Again, yes, the, the fringe elements are always the radicals, and that's who they have conducting all these, uh, you know, anti-terrorism drills and stuff like that. They got the radicals, and they're not necessarily the best trained. Hence, artillery shells are raining down on hospitals. One hospital had three artillery shells rain down on it. That's pretty specific. You know, that's pretty precise. 
So you can see that this is uh, there's two things going on here. The anti-terrorism groups uh, going after the uh, the rebels or whatever is one part one. But the real thing is, if the bankers can't have it, nobody can. Meaning, clear the land, rain artillery, make misery for the, you know, uh, the people there. Uh, basically, destroy their economy. That's that's exactly what's happening. It's not, that's if that's not an act of terrorism, you know what I mean? But that's war, right? And it, it, you know, uh, I mean, it, let's put it to you this way: if this was an all-out civil war, okay, you would see civilian fighting civilian more than what you're seeing now. Like right now, it's yes, technically the soldiers are civilians or, or part of the you know their countrymen or whatever, and a lot of them are conscripts and whatever, and that that sure. But if you look at the majority, you don't have the people in. Uh, you know, running over to the other side, uh, running over to Kiev and killing people there. You don't have that kind of a civil war. It's not like Sunni Shiite type. Of, that that that's a civil war. You know, I mean, that's a that's a well, that's just freaking hell. Uh, but you, you see what I mean? Like you're not having Ukrainians running over here, killing these people. Th these people are part of the army. These people are you know, so they're not really you know. It's it's basically government violence against the people. Now, yes, a lot of wrongs have been done to the Ukrainian people by pro. Russian establishments over the years. I don't dispute that, you know. Like, and, and but what I'm saying in this current situation, uh, they're indiscriminately killing people in that area, uh, whether they're pro-Russian or Ukrainian. It don't matter. Uh, the idea is to destroy the economy there. That's why they burnt out farms. They burnt out, the, you know. Uh, and you have to understand the shelling on both sides is killing the civilians. You know, both sides are killing the civilians. So they're caught between two gangbangers here, right? But the goal is, again, is to get the people out of there. Uh, but it's backfiring on Poroshenko in his own country. Again, we're not really hearing or seeing a lot from inside Ukraine. There is footage out there. As far as the tanks are concerned, uh, the uh, uh, Ukrainian tanks, there's footage from a couple of months ago uh, of them with T-72s. And they say, well, we don't have any tanks. Well, maybe they don't have many left, but they do have them. And yes, they, they've captured a few Russian ones and uh, with the reactive armor. But they also had the ones with reactive armor, or they had the armor put on. So there's a lot of lying coming from the Poroshenko side, too. Uh, I'm not saying, on you know, I mean, you know, again, there's no good guys here. You have, uh, you know, hundreds of, you know, about 400 or so plus soldiers that are being buried in Russia. Okay. Now, the thing is, is what it is, is it's all... Soldiers that are either on vacation, uh, which are not, they're not, they're not in their in the official capacity. They're there on vacation or they're there uh, as, you know, they're, they're, they're retired, uh, you know, they're veterans that are coming over to support. And then, of course, you just have Russian citizens that are just supporting. Now, you have to understand, Putin would play this card this way because, uh, I mean, again, you might get uh, civilians or even soldiers bouncing back and forth across the border. Uh, but equipment is a different story. I mean, that equipment is not like just anybody can walk into a Russian military base and take a T-72 out for a Sunday drive, you know what I mean? Uh, so, obviously, they're going to know what's going back and forth. But again, when they're both using the same equipment, it's really hard to tell what's captured and what's actual. But, you know, the bottom line is, yes, both forces are there. Now, the thing is, is so why would Russia do a proxy war like that? Well, it's very simple. If they did a direct war, NATO, we, we, well, we'd be at a like a shooting more globally right away. It would be instant. Uh, hence the rapid reaction force of NATO being inside the Ukraine. Uh, which uh, I find kind of hypocritical saying that, well, uh, you know, Russia can't go in there because of its interest or to protect the people or whatever, uh, but NATO can. You know what I mean? So, like, again, uh, it's, you know, there's no good guys here. Uh, NATO's, you know, like the, the, the people that... Uh, NATO supporting is killing civilians, you know what I mean? So, you know, and if civilians are really, they're getting hammered, you know what I mean, by artillery on a daily basis. So, you know, you tell me, you know, where would you, which side would you be on? Well, you, you can't pick a side, they're both doing wrong. Um, that said, if Putin does nothing, well, he falls in the polls in Russia. So, everybody that's probably there understands it's a proxy where everybody that's there understands what's going on for the most part, but they might not understand why it's going on. But the bottom line is basically to get the resources. Uh, again, if the central bankers, the EU, the IMF, the United States can't have it, neither can they. Meaning they're, they're destroying the you know farms, they're destroying, they're destroying everything that made money in that side of the country. Uh, that's 
Nothing new in a war scenario. That said, again, I'm not taking any sides. And oh, I might sound come off I'm on one side or the other from time to time, but I'm not. I'm not. I mean, this is all really, you know, the Ukraine, what goes on inside the Ukraine is kind of really irrelevant because it's the reaction to it that you're looking, looking for. What is NATO going to do if Russia did decide to roll official tanks across the border? Well, if we look at it this way, if Russia's not rolling tanks across the border in an official capacity, um, that means that Russia actually is trying to avoid a all-out shooting war. And it seems that it's only Russia that is, is kind of trying to uh, not necessarily de-escalate the situation because they're, not, they're just not letting that area go. Uh, they're going to help the people the best they can, and they're doing it through proxy. So, you know, so Russia is helping, you know, people defend themselves. And you have Ukrainian soldiers that are defecting left, right, and center uh, to the Russian side because they're getting what's going on, you know, and uh, stuff like that. So, uh, you know, you don't hear of anybody defecting from the Russian side to the Ukrainian side quite as much. But I'm sure it's happened, but, you know, but for the most part, the civilians in, in Again, the Maidan protesters are still there. Not a hint of coverage. I mean, they're, they're freaking out. They're saying, look, you're destroying our country. Uh, and for what? You know, this is not what we wanted. We don't want more war. You know, uh, you know and this is the Ukrainians saying this. They're, 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 they're saying, well, what have you done to our country? Why are you killing our... Yeah, okay, we may have a disagreement over there, but why are you killing our own people? You know, and again, it's out there. If you, you know, the odd video does get through. And you could see that the civilians on, well, anywhere, well, who would be happy in Ukraine right now? You know, uh, a Ukrainian lady out there saying, look, my pension, you know, it's been three months since I've gotten a pension. But yet they, they, they put on this war tax, you know what I mean, kind of thing. Um, so that's rocking a hard place. So for there to be peace in that region, uh, Poroshenko has to pull his troops back. They can't, you know, they can't hold that area, you know. Now that said, it doesn't matter what you do. As soon as you pull the troops back, Yes, anybody that's pro-Ukrainian in that area is going to get slaughtered, you know. So it's insolvent. It's completely insolvent, right? So what do you do, right? So, but all this could have been avoided had there been, a, you know, the, uh, the guy that Poroshenko replaced, okay, he was legitimately, whether, yeah, he was corrupt as sin, but he was elected legitimately, okay? He just, he lied, like most politicians. You know, they'll lie to get into office and then do, you know, say one thing, do another. That's nothing new. But after the coup, and again, on the Maidan Square, all the world was outraged when protesters were being shot. And it looks like they were being shot by uh, British rifle rounds. And I don't know, but they don't speci specify what rifle round types they are. The only thing I can think of British rifle rounds is the 303 British, which means those are not official. Uh, Russians don't use 303 British. <laughs> you know, uh, they use uh, you know things like... Uh, 7.62 by 51, 7.62 by 39. Well, you be quiet, dog. So we don't, we still, we're never going to know exactly what happened there. But it's looking more and more like that it was basically a staged coup. Now, the, the right sector guys, the most fringe element, like again, I understand most of the right sector people are nationalists. They're not necessarily neo Nazis. But there's a good proportion of them that are. These are the guys they got to go fight on the other end of the country. Why? Because they have enough hatred in them to go kill civilians and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, again, you have a lot of Ukrainian military out there saying, hey, look, that was a nice parade you had in Kiev the other day. Uh, where's our tanks? Where's our ammunition? You know, why are you keeping the stuff over there shiny and new when we need it over here? You know, so you're going to have a lot of defection from the Ukrainian military at some point. I mean, I'm... And this comes back, there's a Ukrainian military uh, tank driver. I remember he said, look, look, we can roll our tanks onto the Donetsk area, but we could also roll them onto Kiev too. You know, you better, you better make come through with what you said you were going to do for us. And Maidan protesters out there saying, hey, look, these guys, yeah, okay, we understand that we got new oligarchs. You know, <laughs> We wanted to get rid of an oligarch system. Instead of an east oligarch system, you now got a west one. Um, and you have the Ukrainian military out there now, Everywhere they're going, they're just stealing anything that's not nailed down. So, I mean, it's kind of like a war. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, these, are, these are the things that happen during wartime. So, but the thing is, is the morale on the Ukrainian military is like uber low. Um, I say within the year, well, with it, well within the year, uh, we see a Ukrainian military uprising against the Poroshenko regime. 
and the ousting of NATO, the ousting of, like, the Ukrainian military is going to be shooting at NATO. Uh, this is going to be the biggest backfire and blunder uh, of the Obama regime. And the bankers are not going to like this. So they, they're going to have to do something. I think ISIS is their backup plan for, uh, you know, getting... Because, again, it's always about the resources. All wars are about resources. All wars are bankers' wars, okay? Uh, so I'm thinking, with all, you know, the Ukrainian military seeing... Okay, they see a, a military parade that many of the people that were fighting on the front lines in the Donetsk area were not allowed to participate in. They see shiny new equipment staying on that side of the... Uh, when it's needed over on the other end. Uh, and they're not getting paid. They, they don't get ammo. They don't get supplies. They're basically left for dead. Uh, and then they had their asses handed to them a couple of days ago or a week or so ago uh, when the new front got opened up. Uh, so these guys are demoralized as much as possible. So I'm thinking from that, they're just going to say, hey, you guys just, you, you hung us out to dry. And, you know, so this ceasefire thing, we'll have to wait and see what happens. Uh, I'm thinking what Putin probably said to Poroshenko says, look, I could bleed this out for decades if I want. You know, you know, do you really want your people to suffer that much? And the Russians are prepared to do that. So uh, it's very, very clear that they are. Again, there's no good guys here. No good guys here, you know. Uh, but the thing is, is, if you have a country that's already corrupt to the core, uh, economically broken, uh, disorganized, and demoralized to begin with, you know, you really want to do everything you can to de-escalate the war. But Poroshenko's increased the war, not de-escalated. Yes, I mean, how many times has he called for a ceasefire and then roll troops into an area to, and it gets going again? Again, he has to pull the troops back. No matter how you look at it. You pull the troops back, civilians will be killing civilians, uh, you know, as payback. That's kind of what happens. It happened right after World War II. Hey, you were a Nazi sympathizer, they kill you. Hey, you were a Russian sympathizer, they killed you. You know what I mean? Uh, that, you know, that's what it is. But most of the people, you know, that probably kept their opinions to themselves type of thing and just kind of went about their daily business, most of those people are probably going to be fine. But no matter how you look at it, it's going to be, it's a genocide now on one side, it'll be a genocide on the other if it keeps going. Uh, but at some point, uh, again, when you have your re their, their real revolution, Maidan protests were not a full-out revolution. Uh, yes, there was protests throughout the entire country. They were pulling down uh, Lenin, uh, you know, statues and stuff like that. Let, let, let's put it to you this way. There's some people there, okay, that want that glory Soviet empire to, uh, to, uh, to uh, you know, resurrect you know the, the, like one ukrainian soldier said like some of these people are still stuck in the 1940s type mentality you know and uh that type of thing but i mean who the heck could ever possibly uh want to be under the control of like say a stalin or a lenin you know i like it, it that just boggles me. that tells me there's people with mental health issues if they want that uh Nothing good came from those guys. But again, if these people are used to that from decade after decade after decade of just corrupting it, you know, they, it's what they know, right? Uh, so that's not that you know, it's that's not going to go away easily. But that said, uh, the Ukrainian side that does want to be more part of Europe, okay, they want to be part of Europe, but they don't want to be killing their, they don't necessarily want to be killing their fellow countrymen, and they nece don't necessarily like Poroshenko. Uh, so I mean, I'm thinking, okay, you send guys to, uh, you know, and again, that's how they were going to get rid of the right sector guys, because they know these are the guys that are most likely going to overthrow the government now. Look, Libya, the Libyan government, the puppet they put in there, he's gone. The whole Libyan government is now gone. So, uh, guess what? That's what's going to happen to Poroshenko. So all these puppet and regime changes that the U.S., the EU, and the IMF, well, not so much the EU, uh, but, uh, you know, the, the typical countries uh, put in, usually using the U.S. as the, uh, the ones to do the change, it's all backfiring. Egypt backfired. Syria is not working. Uh, they can't get regime change there. They're not going to get regime change there. Um, I don't think they're going to be able to pull it off, you know, even no matter how much they bomb ISIS. Um, you know, Assad got reelected. Yes, Assad, I mean, I'm not saying, I'm just because... Uh, I say they're not going to be able to pull it off. Doesn't mean I'm for the other guy. You got to look at it outside this. You're either on this side or that side. You got to look at the gray in the middle. You, you got to also see it for what it is. And, and there's no good guys here. So, with that said, it's backfire after backfire. They can't get a war going. Uh, ISIS, 
is a war to get going, but it will not be big enough to, because these are just, you know, you're talking about 15,000 ragtag guys, you know. These guys are not going to be enough to uh, get a real war going that you could blame the collapse of an economy on. And at the rate we're going, October might be, look, Canada just lost 11,000 jobs in August, okay. Uh, so we gained a little in July, but we lost in August. And we're in August, or, or September now. Now is when every, you know, kids go back to school, students go back to school, uh, housing slows down, uh, people don't buy as much. Yeah, so, you know, and historically speaking, you know, 1929, 1987, 1990, uh, forget whatever, um, all those, you know, uh, basically economy crashes are typically in October. So be prepared for anything. Who knows what's going to happen? But if that happens, what are the bankers going to say, right? They're scrambling for anything that they have to get a war going because, you know, that's the best way to say, oh, well, and of course they're putting out more sanctions on Russia. Every sanction they put on Russia so far, Russia hits back 10 times harder. Uh, and the EU is suffering because of this. Uh, you know, they're, 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 the, the banksters are, are basically freaking out right now. They don't know what to do because um, they, they just can't seem to pull anything off. So you have to understand, you know, when the economy collapses, a lot of you have to understand, even if it's not an all-out collapse, I don't think we're going to see it as an all-out drop out of the bottom collapse, but it might. You know, at some point, it's just it won't matter what they do. They can't, they can't control this. But I'm thinking what's probably going to happen uh, is it's just a slow bleed out. It's just going to... Everybody being so poor, it's just, okay, the people are just going to freak out and civil unrest. Hence, that's what you saw in uh, Ferguson is what martial law is going to look like, you know. I mean, you had the mainstream media saying, oh, well, you know, we don't like that they rioted and stuff like that, but we understand, you know, maybe to keep this peaceful, maybe we should have checkpoints and stuff. Once you start having checkpoints in your country, you no longer have a free country, you know, in the name of insert ism here, whatever. Um... No, that that's, you know, the idea that we can have a zero risk. No, no. Now with nine eleven on uh, around the corner again, this is always a concern. Who knows? Something may happen. Something may not. Uh, ISIS. Uh, well, who knows? They're, they're threatened to terrorize every country in the world. The thing is, is it's not the, so much the ISIS guys. It's the guys that are already here. Uh, for example, the other day in Britain, there was an eighty-some-year-old lady beheaded by a guy who converted to Islam a year ago. Strangely, it's not all the news right now. Uh, I don't know, you know, it doesn't mean this guy's an ISIS guy, but you have to understand the radicals are there. They're already in your country, pick, insert country name here. They're, they're already there. Uh, so they got to get something going. Now, to finish up with Ukraine, what I'm thinking is that you're going to see another coup. Probably, I would imagine within, as soon as winter comes, uh, if they don't have a full-out war going by winter, uh, the first snowfall, technically, um, speaking of snowfalls, not to divert too much, I'm pretty sure I said at one of my videos that there would be snow by September. September 1st, they got a massive amount of snow in Alberta. It didn't stay, I'm sure, but <laughs> the weather this year has just been all kind of all over the map. It's kind of like when I was a kid, so to speak, cooler. Uh, but uh, bottom line, I say as soon as it starts getting cold, uh, people are going to get so miserable, you're going to have just defections and coups and... Uh, the Ukraine military is going to be all over the place. At that point, NATO will probably have to step in, um, even though Ukraine's not, like, it's insolvent. It's insolvent. I mean, you know, there's no solution here. Uh, the best thing to do is just everybody back away from it. Uh, I do believe the right sector guys had the right thing, kick everybody out, kick out the, uh, uh, the Russian influence, kick out the American influence, kick them all out. Nationalism. Nationalism does protect the country. Problem is, is that, in this insolvent kind of state that they're in, the right sector guys will just go to, to genocide right away. They'll just, you know, that's how they're going to solve it is, you know, because that's how it works out in history, right? Uh, radical begets radical. So uh, the right sector guys have the right idea, but I might not necessarily like their approach, and their approach is going to be to get the Nazi faction of it. And there is a Nazi faction. Again, in the 1940s, you had a choice to be in under the Hitler regime or the Stalin regime. That, that was your choices. Not good choices for most people. You had to pick a side or, you, you know, and that's, and you're still seeing a lot of that today, you know. So, uh, again, the people that want to become more European, and, and they're, they're never going to have that, you know. That was never part of the plan. They were never, ever going to get that. Look, the European deal got shot down by the previous guy, 
okay? And he basically said, look, it's not a good enough deal for us yet. Would they ever do it? Who knows? Being pro-Russian, uh, don't know where that guy is now, if he's even still alive. Uh, you know, Putin came out one time and said, no, I didn't kill him, he's still alive. You know, like, what do you, you know, I, I think Putin has played into more of a supervillain than he actually is, but I think he's underestimated a lot more than what he should be. Uh, so, again, Putin not being a good guy. There's no good guys here, you know, uh, but... The only reason why we're not in a shooting war right now is because Russian tanks haven't rolled across the border. But yet, again, he's not going to let the people there just get slaughtered left, right, and center. Um, you know, uh, uh, of you know, in, in the Crimea and stuff like that. You know, Crimea was never going to go anywhere. You know, he's got that. That's all he really cares about. That's all he really needs. He would like to have that corridor from the Crimea right through to Russia. Uh, and that's probably going to happen, but not for a while. People in the Ukraine, like I said, they would be screaming for Russia to come to their rescue. You have people even on the other side of the country starting to scream for Russia to come to the rescue just to stop all this madness. And that, so he's going to let people suffer because of that. I mean, if they wanted to stop it, they could stop it very, very quickly. Uh, just increase the supplies, increase the weaponry. They don't even have to get directly involved. Again, keep the proxy war going. And you're seeing the weaponry is kind of uh, stepping up. Um, you know, Russia doesn't have... A lot of amazing weaponry, but they've got a lot of okay weaponry. And that's the stuff you're seeing there. But uh, there was a tank column that was destroyed, uh, tanks, and uh, mostly, uh, uh, I think it was like one T-72. The rest were like BMP 1s and 2s and a bunch of uh, BTR 40s and 60s or whatever. Uh, or BTRs? Yeah, BT whatever they are there that they're, they, they have the most of. Uh, and the whole column was destroyed in a row. So that suggests to me that was probably a strafing run from probably... A, a helicopter or something. But however, the uh, uh, forward, the uh, national observers said they haven't seen any helicopters come across the Russian border. So I'm saying either that was a very well coordinated RPG attack where they hit like six or seven vehicles at a time, uh, you know, or, you know, S-8 rocket uh, from a, like a Black Shark helicopter, which a helicopter could, you know, or even, a, say, like a Havoc or a Black Shark, they could sneak in and pass the borders and undetected pretty easily. Um, you know, they're a pretty deadly machine. Uh, they're kind of like the counter to the Apache heli attack helicopters. Those attack helicopters are, are usually the most lethal of any battlefield weapon, you know. Uh, plus, they're flying tanks, you know. So, uh, yeah, so the, the coordination of attack, that, that suggests to me people who know what they're doing. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm believing that there's a lot of the people that are fighting are being trained, obviously, by the Special Forces guys. And, you know, they're getting better training than what the Ukrainian guys are getting. The Ukrainian guys are basically, they're not really getting any training. They're just being sent to fight. You know, it's like, here, this is how Kalishnikov works. Figure out your tactics on, when, you know, during the fight. Bad place to be trying to figure out tactics. Um, so there is a lot of... You know, uh, and on both sides, too, whether they're pro-Russian or... Uh, and I can't really call them pro-Russian. I think it's more just they're defending their area. But there's a lot of untrained guys just whipping grenades into anything. You know, it's like, well, I don't know who's in there, but I'm throwing the grenade in there. You know, and a lot of civilians are getting killed like that because of the lack of training on both sides. Uh, so it's just recipe for disaster. Uh, Two-year-old driving a semi. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's what you know. That's what you got going on here. Uh, very, 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 very destructive. Uh, so there's a lot of that going on as well. But with the artillery, I think the artillery is pretty precise. Um, I don't think that's the hodgepodge guys. I think that's the better trained guys uh, using the artillery on both sides. Um, but the artillery is very. It's really seems to be. You know, like they give an order. Okay, we're going to shell this area for uh, at this time. So if you're a civilian. Don't be there, you know. We're going to shell this and, you know, like, I, that's a crazy way to fight a war, but that's how they're doing it. Um, so, again, if you're, you know, and you're talking, you know, like people who've lost their entire families, you know, their homes or entire families, uh, you know, and artillery shells don't discriminate either. So, so it's just a mess there. And, of course, I'm sure there's a lot of Ukrainian forces that don't want to be doing that either. It's like, why am I killing these people again? You know, you're asking us to fight, and this is a Ukrainian soldier saying this, you're asking us to fight, but why again? Now, again, uh, one of the best coverage, I think, is so far is Vice. Because they're covering both angles. They're covering from the, the uh, pro-Russian side and from the, uh, we'll just call them pro-Russian side. Uh, because, again, you can call them freedom fighter, you can call them rebel, you can call them terrorist, pro-Russian, whatever. They might not necessarily be pro-Russian, but 
it's what rebels is kind of what people recognize. So we'll say rebels and, and uh, Ukrainian forces. Okay, so uh, both sides are, you know, they're covering both sides from the pro-Ukrainian, from the pro-Russian side. So, the, you know, the, the Ukrainian military to the, uh, to, the, to the rebels. The rebels know what they're fighting for. Uh, you know, they're fighting for their, their land, their territory, whatever. Uh, and most of them are from the region, you know. Like, uh, and some of them have admit, yeah, the Russians gave us this, the Russians gave us that. That's how Putin's getting involved. It's a proxy war, you know. Again, he doesn't really want the Ukraine. The Ukraine's insolvent. It's, it's, it's a, you know, it's, 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 it's debt-ridden, you know. It's, it's collapsing. It's, you know, everybody's out of work right now. You know, you know what I mean? Plus, there's a civil war slash genocide going on there. So nobody wants that. And on the Ukrainian side, uh, they're, you know, vice covering both the Ukrainian side. A lot of, again, a lot of these guys, they're sending us here to fight, but we don't know what for, and they're not really equipping us well. And yet they're parading tanks all over, brand new shiny equipment all over Kiev Square for their independence at the other time. At the same time, the uh, pro-Russian forces are uh, parading uh, POWs up and down the street and with uh, burnt out tank columns and uh, APC columns, you know, on display. You know, it's demoralizing for the military. Like, again... They're going to have a coup within the year. I, I can almost guarantee it. Look, if we go back to the Maidan protest, uh, in my coverage of that, there's so many things I said in that the video, uh, you know, saying, hey, look, this is Putin's line in the sand, and it is. Uh, but there's so many things that I've said there that have come to pass, you know. Uh, and it's not that, you know, I'm clairvoyant or anything like that. It's that two plus two don't make five. And, you know, it's just that big picture. If you really understand that this is all about the resources being ripped away from the Ukrainians uh, to destabilize Russia, if you understand it as a east-west kind of war, then the details that go on within the Ukraine make more sense. The, why, they, why the Ukraine, what's going on in Ukraine doesn't make sense uh, is because you're looking at the smaller picture. You're looking at just the Ukraine. Uh, again, pre-Maidan protests, people on all sides of the country were not shooting at each other even if they had cultural differences, you know, they weren't shooting at each other left, right, and center. Uh, right after, again, who initiated the anti-terrorism groups? <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Uh, what he should have done is say, okay, oh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have our guys on standby. Because those people at that point, yeah, there was people beating each other up and whatever. And it was happening, people getting hauled away in the middle of the night from both sides. You have, the, again, the rebel side, the uh, uh, anti-terrorism side, Ukrainian military. Both of these guys were pulling, and they're still doing it. They're pulling people out. You know, we think you're part of the, this group, so we're going to pull you out and kill you, you know. And people, did, you know, so there's genocides and bad things happening on both sides. And how do you quell that? Well, there's other ways to do it. When you're a country that doesn't have the money to actually fight a war, um, or the equipment, or the training, the best thing to do is kind of let things die down. The Crimea would still be a part of Russia, or a part of the Ukraine, had... They not used the neo-Nazi faction to overthrow the government. That's what people were protesting, is they didn't want to be under Nazism. It, you know, and understandable. You know, nobody wanted... I mean, I wouldn't want to be under Nazis, and I also wouldn't want to be under communists either. However, communist being... Well, socialist communist is kind of like the norm for most countries. Uh, we're socialist fascist here. Uh, even though, you know, like the governments say they're this, but, the, you know, like, for example, they say we've got a conservative government, but everything they do is socialist fascism. You know, they're, 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 not, they're not conservative. Uh, we don't get more liberties, we get less liberties. Each government takes more and more and more. Um, at some point, uh, government makes peace impossible, you know, to, you know, uh, to, to uh, and, and that's what you have in the Ukraine. So there's no easy answers there, but they could have started by not rolling tanks into the other side of the country, uh, let things cool down a bit, win the hearts and minds back. You're not going to, you know, you have Ukrainian people out there saying, look, how the heck are they going to win the hearts and minds, you know, by killing us, you know? Uh, again, because you have pro-Ukrainian people on the other side of the country where this, these genocides are taking... Again, the genocide's indiscriminate. It's about destroying the economy there. Why? Because this is, goes to the EU, the IMF. This benefits them. Why? Because if they can't make money over there, hey, you know... Uh, and, and this is... Uh, the Ukraine's a liability for so many countries right now. I don't know, even know why Canada's involved, but we're involved because of the banking system. That's the only reason why we're involved. We're not, yes, we have 1.2 million Ukrainians here in Canada, uh, descendants, okay, it's largest outside the Ukraine. And I can understand a moral, but to start putting boots on the ground, which we have, we've got about 100 advisors there, uh, to start, you know, sending millions of dollars in aid, 
apparently non-lethal aid, but I think this NATO drill that's happening in the Ukraine is how they're going to give the lethal aid to... Well, we'll see it in the footage. Once you start seeing M16s and Abrams tanks and uh, stuff like that in the hands of the Ukrainian military, you'll know, you'll know how they got it. You know, the Russian stuff, you can figure out how they got it. Uh, the American equipment, you'll figure... It's the same reason why you've got ISIS running around with, you know, again, the CIA, the biggest terrorist organization on the planet, paid for ISIS. This was the Free Syrian Army. Now, of course, Al-Qaeda is coming back in full swing. Um, the Taliban has just done a, a major attack the other day. So, of course, you know, ISIS is the catalyst of all this, but it's run by a, an ex-Mussad guy. There's no such thing as ex-Mussad. Um, so the leader of ISIS is basically an ex-Mussad guy. Um, CIA it's just, again, the bankers want us to get into war to blame the collapse of the economy on I don't think it will really matter all we will get is a war, but these bankers they're, they're, they're best to face and again, if we actually you know, uh, have uh, you know, intelligent law enforcement and military never mind going after the drug guy, never mind going after the guy who stole the you know, shoplifted Go after the big money. Go after the big fish. Yes, you can get them. You don't have to charge them with a million things. You know, just crimes against humanity is good enough. Um, but we need brave law enforcement military to step up and put these madmen and, and women in jail before they get us all killed. Uh, again, the only one keeping us out of a full nuclear exchange right now, I hate to say it, is Russia. You know, uh, And they're pushing, they're backing Russia into a corner. At some point, they will have to respond. We're not going to like that. The bankers think, okay, well, we'll just go into our bunkers. And again, uh, these elites have been hiring extra security bankers and all that. They've been hiring extra security. They've been buying stuff for civil unrest and all over the world. They know what's coming because they are engineering it. You know, <laughs> unfortunately, even getting back to the Ukraine here, uh, NATO, the Western countries, the European countries, we're not the good guys here. We've caused all this problem. You know. Um, Russia is just responding to, again, yes, the Russians did a coup in the Ukraine, but they did a counter-coup, okay? So, you know, you don't see Victoria Nuland out there on the Maidan Square supporting the protesters now. You know what I mean? So, uh, if you want to keep tabs of what's going on in, in the Maidan protesters, uh, even though it's a, you know, they're, they're more from the pro-Ukrainian side, you can check out the Euromaidan uh, YouTube page, um, you know, they'll do all, their propaganda ba- or the uh, Ukra- Ukraine Today page, that type of thing. You, you can see what they're saying, but you can also see that they do show, the, you know, again, it's propaganda, Russia Today, Ukraine Today, they're both are propaganda machines, right? Uh, and somewhere in the middle. The, the first casualty of war is always truth, right? Hence why I try to be as non-biased as possible. I just call it as I see it. But the bottom line is Putin is responding to his pu- the public outcry for him to do things. But he's also allowing the people in the Ukraine to suffer enough that they're going to scream for that $15 billion bailout that they were going to get. And from that point, yes, the Ukraine, uh, once the Ukrainian military starts completely turning on their own people, uh, and they will, they will, you know, they're going to, they're going to roll the tanks into Kiev at some point uh, and overthrow the government there. The uh, right sector guys, they're going to be thrown under the bus, no way fans or buts simply due to the fact that they've already said, look, if Poroshenko doesn't get the nip this in the bud, we're going to clear out the government. That's what the, that's their, the right sector guy, leader. You know, it's not his people that follow him. It's him, okay? They already killed off a lot of the most radical of the right sector guys that did the coup, okay? Um, you know, so again, the moderates, a lot of the moderates can't understand how the radicals work. And they, they say, no, 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 the right sector guys are all, they're, they're not these Nazi guys. The, the, the guys that get the stuff done, yeah, they're, they're like the, the brown shirts that Hitler had. And they will be thrown under the bus. They are being thrown under the bus. You know, let's send them over to that side of the country and piss poorly arm them, and hopefully they'll get killed so they don't overthrow us later on. That's what's happening to those guys. Um, so, bottom line, uh, I see a major counter, counter, counter coup going on. Russia will love this because that's when Russia will bring out the tenderness and the caring. They're going to bring out, you know... Victoria Newland brought out uh, uh, biscuits and, and cookies. Uh, Russia's going to bring money, gas, <laughs> jobs. Uh, again, it's still it's still a, another you know it, it's still a, it's still going to be corrupt. The Ukraine is insolvent until the people there. The only people that could actually save this, I hate to say it, is the right sector guys uh, because they're nationalists. They don't want Russia in there. They don't want the EU in there. They don't want the IMF in there. Um, and that, that's and you take out all those other factions that I just mentioned, 
Uh, the problem is, is right sector guys are going to kill a lot of civilians just out of genocide because they hate the other side that much. But the, again, it will stabilize the area. Um, you know, and they can't have stabilization. Putin can't have stabilization there because then people won't. He's basically drawing people to them. You know, you have Ukrainian people out there screaming for Russia to come in and intervene to stop the genocide on the other side of the country. Uh, you have people ripping up their conscripts uh, and, and freaking out about the war tax and the gas off and their, you know, lost jobs and their, uh, you know, pensions and stuff like that being cut. Um, you, there's, it's going to be a huge coup slash revolution type of thing. Um, that's how these things usually happen. Uh, yeah, you know. And then at that point, the EU, the IMF, uh, with the sanctions on Russia, the complete loss of Ukraine. Ukraine right now is a drain on the system to the Europeans. Um, uh, at that point, we're probably going to see a, a major financial calamity throughout the world. Uh, Russia is dealing with the sanctions much better than what Europe is. Uh, you know, and Russia still has China. They can do trade with each other for years while the rest of us are uh, in rubble. You know what I mean? Uh, so you, you can see that it's... Uh, Currency war, trade war, shooting war. And we're somewhere in the middle of the shooting war, trade war right now. So, anyway, I guess I'm babbling now, but that's just the way I'm seeing it. I'll leave it at that, so you guys have yourselves a good day, and uh, there we go. Good day, hi, and welcome. Okay, so what's going on uh, over there somewhere? Well, looks like uh, a peace deal has been signed, and NATO. Uh, Summit has just ended. Uh, I was watching a little bit of what Rasputin had to say. It looks like uh, they're going to get everybody to commit to 2% of their gross domestic product uh, over the next 10 years to uh, contribute to a rapid reaction force. Uh, meanwhile, there is rapid reaction forces in the Ukraine uh, doing drills. Uh, Canada is a part of it as well. Uh, and so on and so on. Now again, this is something I've always said about drills being very close to the zone of conflict. And they always train for, they're shows of force, they're not necessarily actual drills. Because, you know, when you have uh, a conflict, you, you, you know, uh, doing a drill right beside it is, you know, kind of provocateuring, right? Um, most people see that. So that said, uh, the peace plan apparently was signed between Poroshenko and uh, uh, Putin. Um, I'm thinking that uh, Putin's 12-point peace plan, uh, I haven't looked at all the details of it, uh, but they're looking at it, and um, there's still shelling going on in, in, in the Ukraine. Um, I think it's kind of a, a bit of a crossroad. You have to understand, the central bankers, they want to get us into a war any means necessary. Uh, a lot of people probably still have a hard time with that concept, but yes, these people like they, they're they're complete psychopaths. They're they're, you know, because if we don't get into a war and war being a racket and making money, if we don't get into a war, uh, the economies there's going to be nobody to blame the economy failure on, and that's not looking good right now for the for economies around the world, uh, which I'll probably touch in another video because it, there's just too much to talk about on just that front. There's a lot going on right now, like tons going on. Uh, very scary. Uh, that said, um, you have military advisors inside the Ukraine for God knows how long now, uh, a couple of months anyway. Uh, so it's kind of funny how, <coughs> okay, um, there seems to be a bit of a debate whether Ukraine is a part of NATO or not. Well, it, technically it's not. So you're probably saying, well, what's the Ukraine doing there? What's NATO doing in there? Well, Ukraine is NATO's interest to become relevant again, you know, because NATO hasn't been relevant for a long time. And I don't, and NATO's a waste of money. It, it really is. The money people spend to stay into NATO, okay, uh, that money could be put into their own military defenses. And they probably spend more on NATO than they do on their own military defenses. And they could have state-of-the-art stuff, state-of-the-art training, you know, and that, that would be good enough. Uh, Canada, we're not too bad off military-wise. Uh, a lot of people don't realize how much we've invested, reinvested into our military. It kind of goes like this. 1950s and 60s, we had about 80,000 soldiers uh, because of the Cold War Part 1. We're in Cold War Part 2 now. And we ended up getting a, a fairly big military. And right after World War II, we were like the 
one of the largest militaries in the world. We were very, 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 very large. Uh, but Canada decided that we weren't going to be uh, a global military. We were, you know, uh, we did peacekeeping. And uh, I used to object to the peacekeeping role, and I still kind of do because of how it's implemented. Uh, and it got a lot of guys killed. But it was better than a direct combat role. The problem is, is in the day we live in, this day and age is, you know, there, there's no places where you can put peacekeepers. You know, if you need peacekeepers, you need you need a combat role. So it's kind of like they're shooting at each other, right? And you're caught, you know, monkey in the middle. Uh, you know, trying to play referee. So, you know, peacekeeping has its, its challenges and its downsides. But it's a lot, it's non-aggressive. You know what I mean? Like, it's, you know, it's, it, it is better because, you know, you de-escalate the situation. And Canada was known as a peacekeeping country forever and ever and ever. Then 9-11 happened, uh, you know, at a time when uh, Kretzsche was out there saying, oh, we don't need tanks. Tanks are, you know, they don't use those on the battlefield anymore. We don't need them. And, you know, we our, our military had been gutted pretty much from the Trudeau years to the Kretzsche years. Uh, even through the Maroonie years, I mean, there, there was, uh, Maroonie didn't really spend that much on the military. Our military kind of flatlined it. Now we're about 25, 30,000 guys, and then maybe 300,000 personnel all in. Uh, that's number bounces around, so it, it's hard to say. But you have to understand the training our guys get now is second to none, and uh, a lot of the equipment we use is very, very state of the art. Uh, a lot of it's still hand me down American equipment, but uh, even with that, uh, there's a lot of Canadian innovations where we take a, a, you know slightly worn equipment and turn it into you know you know stuff that suits Canada's needs much better. Uh, but that that's kind of where we're at, and right now. Uh, we're kind of de-escalating our military a little bit because, you know, the role in Afghanistan is kind of uh, wound down. But it looks like we're back into Iraq as well. Uh, we've got 100 military advisors there. Military advisors is basically boots on the ground. You know, they won't call it boots on the ground, but that's what it is, you know. So we're getting involved with this ISIS thing. We're getting involved with the Ukraine. Uh, Canada does not have the, the money to do that, you know, uh, so if we're putting money into that, we're taking money from our country's defense. That, that's guaranteed. That That's what NATO does. It's it's, it's a leech. Um, some people might like NATO. I'm not a fan of NATO. I never was. Um, you know, I don't think NATO is really needed for the most part because, uh, yeah, coalition forces, you don't need NATO to make coalition forces, you know. Uh, and the idea, well, yeah, but you have to have that guarantee people are going to come to your rescue. There's no guarantees in anything like that. You know, there's no guarantees. Because what happens, let's say two allied countries actually attack each other, uh, and they're both NATO members. Then what do you do? You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? So to me, sovereignty is more important than a global, uh, you know, Agenda 21 type military. And that, that's NATO. That NATO is basically the banker's military. Um, and when you're looking at it like that, it, it kind of says, you know, if you take more, say, like a Switzerland type of approach where your military protects your country, Look, Switzerland is a neutral country. They, you know, they stay peaceful. They, but mind you, Switzerland is a neutral country for probably not the reasons a lot of people think. 